Um, so I'm going to be talking about reducing energy in materials processing. I'm going to try and tell a bit of a story. Uh, I'm going to show you some stuff that we've done on trying to model materials flows and energy flows in some processing. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about a factory that is, is very uh, inspiring and hopefully follow some of the things that, that uh, you heard already this morning from both Steve and from Gunther. And um, I'm going to come up with, hopefully, well, I, this is a vision that perhaps we should be thinking about factories as having, or manufacturing processes as having energy badges, like, rather like we expect on our fridges and our white goods and, and other products. We should be, up, be able to think of processes of, as having a starred ratings or um, AA starred, triple A starred ratings, although triple A starred ratings in the banking system is not help, helping the UK very much at the moment. But we should be looking at our manufacturing processes in this way and, and looking not at um, just single measurements, but their whole impact. So that's, that's my sort of modus operandi uh, as to what, how I work. So I think, the, where am I coming from? Why, why is this important in, in worldwide terms? This is a, a chart that Julian Allwood from here in Cambridge produced in about 2005, looking at global energy and at global energy flows. It, I, I find it wonderful because it's very informative and it's very pretty, and you, you can very easily follow what's going on here. Uh, but the important thing is, if you can see the red dot, it's this bit here. It's this chunk of stuff is our materials. And that takes something like 35%, 30%, between 30 and 35% of our, um, our total energy usage in the world. So if we can reduce that, we're going to reduce our demand, our energy demands. Um, and those materials go into all sorts of places. They go all over, for, all the way down here. They go into everything uh, in, our, in our life. Materials is a very important part of your life. Um, and the traditional materials, the big ones, are steel, chemicals, which is polymers and things, papers in there. So if we change them to, that, that will become mineral. Then if we go to stone paper, of course. Um, uh, aluminium, another big one. Uh, um, uh, and um, we also have cement. Cement, we heard uh, yesterday in one of the other sessions, is, is a massive uh, part of our world economy, three and a half billion tons of cement produced every year. That's three times as much in terms of tonnage as, as steel, but um, considerably more in terms of volume because of its lower density. Um, so basically, when we look at our, our raw materials or we look at our, the materials that as we need them, getting useful material from an ore is energy intensive. 4% of the world's energy is used in comminution. Comminution is crushing, grinding, getting the stuff at, to the right size that we want it. That's a lot of energy. Um, there's, as I said, a, a very large amount of our energy goes into manufacturing. And I like to think about liquid metals. I, I, I work in the world of liquid metals. Uh, because if you're dealing with metals, generally speaking, it has to be liquid at some stage if you want to do anything with it. Uh, so we end up melting our metal before we can make something that's actually usable. And we've known this for a long time. The metal melting industry is 6,000 years old. It's one of our earliest manufacturing processes uh, in terms of really un industrial. So 6,000 years old, we've been melting metal. And quite honestly, it's probably only in the last 50 years, maybe 75 years, that we've done anything different. So we're, we're really up against it. We're up against a huge amount of inertia in terms of, of the, the people and the knowledge. Um, polymers, which is an industry which is probably only 75 years old, um, is also very energy intensive and highly inefficient in the same way. It doesn't use quite as much energy in, its, in, in, in some ways, but in, in other areas it's just as similarly inefficient in terms of its use of the materials. So the amount of material that goes back out, so yields are particularly low. So yields, as I say, are low. Often in metals, they can be less than 50%. Well, why, why would metals have a yield of 50 less than 50%? Basically because of physics. We're, we're trying to fight against physics and against this inertia in changing ways in which we've been doing things for 6,000 years. Uh, and, and that's only at the end of a process stage. If we look at the end of the, pro at the product stage, we quite often find the yields are even worse than 50%. And in some sectors, and I come on to looking at different sectors in a minute, 
that in some sectors it's, it's dreadful. And those are sectors that you are all well aware of and you all use on a very frequent basis and you should be changing or helping to change, maybe by crowd pressure. Often in the industry, recycling is, is considered good. Now we're all good environmental friendly people here in the audience. Is recycling good? Only as a last resort. What we should be aiming for is looking at making sure we make the processes more efficient in the first place so we don't have to recycle as much. Because every time you go through that recycling route, you're putting back more energy. And recycling in the metals industry in particular, and the polymer industry, means really going almost right back, not to the mine, but back to that primary stage where you're taking up yet more energy to melt the material, going through that, that change of, tra that transformation stage, that change of state. So we have a, these are the materials processing stages. We have extraction, which involves mining, comminution, leaching, separation. Then we have a preparation stage, which quite often smelting or metal extraction, which uh, may be different for different metals. So for steel, that would be a thermal extraction. For aluminium, it's an electrolysis. electrolysis. And those are the two big metals that we use throughout the world. Um, and then you have refining and alloying. And then you have shaping, so some sort of shape conversion process, which is an area that I work in a lot. So this is where you, you, know, you make your, your pistons for your, en your engine in your car or your cylinder block or, or the, do the door handles that you see on doors, this sort of thing. Um, and then you may have reprocessing. So you might have some recovery, some recycling, some reuse and remanufacture. So of course we should be encouraging the reuse, remanufacture and the recovery, the recovery first, but the bit we should be downgrading, as it were, is the recycling bit that goes actually truly through a recycling loop in the same way. Now, this is a, a chart that was produced by, by Mike Ashby, which looks at lots of ways of reducing resources, and, and, and they look very heavily at this side in terms of materials efficiency. I, I think the one area, so light weighting, dematerialization, remanufacture, Doing it with doing without doing with less, yeah, that's very important. Design for remanufacture, all very very good things. The one thing that misses that is missing off here, and this is all very materials oriented, is is disruptive, innovative manufacturing processes because that can help all of these things, and that's the bit that is very difficult to introduce into a lot of industries. If I look now at the UK. Liquid metal industry, uh, I should say the shape casting type of industry rather than the, the, the steel industry. Um, although I'm sure Louis Brimacombe in the audience can talk very well about the steel industry. We don't have much of a primary aluminium industry in this, in this country anymore. It all disappeared in about the 1990s um, and went to the places where, of course, uh, uh, energy was cheaper and much, much more environmentally degrading. So places like China and um, uh, where they're using coal-fired uh, electricity, electrically oriented power stations, um, Russia, um, the Middle East, where they're burning oil to create um, electricity to do the, electrolysi the electrolysis for aluminium. Uh, because that's the way you get aluminium. You, do, you use a lot of energy from electrical energy to, to create the aluminium. So um, in, the, in the shape shaping industry of, of, of liquid metals, I believe the process efficiency is somewhere between 0.1 and 1%. That's, that's absolutely dreadful. Um, in the UK, we happen to have 50% of the European investment casting sector. We have about 50 companies do it, uh, doing investment casting. Why is that important? It's, a, it's an incredibly important part of the UK economy, although it's not huge, because it's a tier one supplier into the aerospace industry. So Airbus, Rolls-Royce, all depend on investment casting companies to supply them with their products. And these are, um, we, we have that expertise in this country, and that part uh, of the industry then, so is a part of the supply chain for the industry, which is 140 billion pounds turnover a year. That's the aer aerospace industry in the UK. And there's a lot of jobs, and we're second in the world uh, to the US. So it's really important that we help this industry survive because it supplies a lot of jobs. It, it's a significant contributor to UK manufacturing, um, but it uses about 4% of the manufacturing uh, energy. Uh, 
in the, in the casting sector generally, there are about 400 companies, about 20,000 jobs, and about a three billion turnover. So it's not small, but it's, it's not huge, but it's not tiny. And it's worthwhile, as I say, continuing to support because of the fact it supplies the aerospace industry, and we still do have an, air, uh, um, an automotive sector that requires casting. So the Toyotas of the world still buy castings from local suppliers. The Jaguar Land Rovers, the, uh, the, the Aston Martins uh, still buy castings from our UK industries, UK companies. So that's the size of the, 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 the pot. And it's mainly SMEs. So I like that because it's much easier to convince an SME to work with you and to help them change uh, than it is for me to convince Airbus, for example, to work with me, even though I've got friends in Airbus sitting in the audience. Um, it is actually easier to work because quite often the decision-making process is very short. You'll be talking to the chairman. You'll be talking to the, to the owner quite often. But they still got a lot of inertia because they don't have a lot of expertise and technology. Now let's get to some physics. So the, this, is, this is really, st I started to think about this some, some years ago, and then when I heard Steve Hope talk about Gentani, I thought this is exactly the sort of thing that I, I've been thinking about for a long time, and I've now started to take these sorts of th philosophies on board. So if I look at how much energy I need to melt one tonne of, of liquid metal, uh, how much do I need? So for aluminium, I need uh, about, actually, this, yeah, this is megajoules, so that's uh, per kilogram. But if we, if we multiply everything by 1,000, it comes up to the same number. So it's one gigajoule per ton, or one megajoule per kilogram. Same, same figures. Um, if we look at steel, it's exactly the same. Well, that's interesting. How comes that? Because, you know, you, steel melts at about 1,600, and, and aluminium melts at 660. How come you need the same amount of energy? What will you do? I mean, that's just physics. Uh, and in fact, magnesium, which is even lighter, you need uh, about the same again. So I took a rough punt and I thought, well, all our engineering materials need about a gigajoule per tonne. And, and that's about right if you go through you know, nickel and, 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 and cobalt and all the other things that, you, that we, we work with. So why, why are we interested in cobalt? Because it's used in the biomedical industry. Um, nickel, because it's used in the aerospace industry for turbine blades. And it's all about a gigajoule per tonne. So remember, a gigajoule per tonne. It's a really, really important figure. So if we move on, and we say, we look at a, a product. This is a sort of uh, schematic of what happens in a foundry. So if you look at the green thing, the green, the green stuff, so this is the direction, the flow of material. And this is show, showing if we start with with a ton of material, how it degrade, how it gets smaller as we go through the process. Uh, and then how much goes back through into recycling, uh, how much is lost, the red bits in oxidation, uh, or, or lost by, by the, the, just through the process in some way. Um, and you can see if we take one ton of material, um, most f furnaces are probably not more than 50% efficient. So if, if we need one gigajoule per tonne to melt, to, to melt theoretically, by the time we've gone through the first melting stage, we need at least two gigajoules per tonne. So we've already doubled the amount of energy we need to theoretically melt that amount of material. It's very, very simple. When we've lost 2% of the material by oxidation, that obviously then increases how much we need per tonne of good material. And we li then we hold, hold the material perhaps for... Well, I've been in foundries where they hold the material for 13 or 14 hours at a time uh, at temperature. So you've got lots of radiation losses. So there's another loss. Then we get to, we have to clean it. If we've held it for that long, it gets dirty. So we then have to clean it. Uh, and then we have to cast it. Now, when we cast it, we've got to get the metal into a shape. To get it into a shape, into a hole, we have to have a channel. We have to have a, a, a conduit of some form. And then we have to look at the physics. The physics says that when you cast liquid metal and it changes from liquid to solid, it shrinks by about 10%. So it's not the same size as it was when you thought it, uh, that you thought you were going to get. So you've got to add more metal to make that, th that fully dense. So we add things called feeders. And the feeders are stuck on the sides, uh, and they, they stay liquid for longer than the shape that you're casting. 
but you can't just add 10% more. You probably have to add something like 30 or 40% more metal to make sure that that liquid still stays solid until the final shape that you want actually solidifies. So we then cut that off, and in most cases, they put it round through the recycling loop. So the physics is the physics against us. I mean, we're never going to get rid of that shrinkage uh, if we want solid material. We've got to add some extra liquid. So that's why, at this particular point, we, we suddenly start losing maybe 60% or 30% of the material comes off. Then we get to the finishing stage where we have to grind or f uh, fettle something, make it cleaner, and then we might actually have to end up um, machining it to, to, to fit better. Because you can get so far with castings, but quite often you can't get to the final finished shape, so we'll have to do some finished machining. That may, uh, may be as much as 25% in terms of volume of what you've got left at that particular point. That's not 25% of the original ton. This is 25% of the, 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 the one ton minus the 2% for oxidation during melting, 2% during holding, 40% during casting, you know, the, the, all those losses. So it's only 25% of what you've got left. So you can see how these figures start to add up and multiply. So by the time, and then you get to inspection, and I know for some foundries, say for an automotive wheel foundry where they're making alloy wheels, um, you might lose 20% uh, by scrap. That's, so that goes out the window. I've done some calculations where I've used some, some uh, life cycle um, sort of calculations that were um, developed by Louis Brimacombe, who's in the audience, so I'll embarrass him by saying this is your stuff, uh, where I, I work out the, the um, uh, amount of energy per tonne of, uh, of material that's required uh, on a, uh, after multiple recycling, so um, infinitely recycled material, which is not the case in most, in most cases. And I've done a comparison with, different, with, with foundries in different sectors. And I get to the point where I have the automotive sector has this, uh, this figure of 25 gigajoules per tonne, uh, but then I look at how much material is left at the end of the process, and it's only 27% when I've gone through my, my stuff. So my process energy per burden is, is 93 gigajoules per tonne. I then look at the aerospace uh, sector, assuming the aerospace sector recycles, which it doesn't, and I get to the figure of 258 gigajoules per tonne. I then look at the aerospace as it is, and I get to the figure of 1,000 gigajoules per tonne because their yields are so dreadful in most cases, something like 5%. If I then... Uh, you can see now that the, the foundry industry is not only intense but the foundries use from 90 to 1,500, in some cases, gigajoules per tonne to produce one tonne of shipped castings. Um, and it's an estimate that the, the aluminium sector actually uses 2% of the UK industrial energy. Um, so we have a project called uh, Small is Beautiful, where we, these are the guidelines. Start with high-quality feedstock, high quality and only melt what you want when you want it. Rather than holding it at long times, you just melt in as, as quickly as possible. You then don't have to treat the metal. You then can put the metal in when you want it. Don't assume recycling is internal scrap is OK. And design for filling uphill rather than pouring. And that means we can improve the yields. When we do that, we start to, and try and recover the low-grade heat. Uh, from solidification, because every tonne of material has a tonne of, has a gigajoule of energy, which you've just let go off into the atmosphere, usually. So if we, if we then take this, and we look at Crimson, our new process, and we, and we do the, the same calculation, we end up with a figure of 63 gigajoules per tonne. But then if we look at the added benefits of the fact we actually get a better quality product as well, so if you compare with like we like, it's 63. But if you then take into consideration we actually get a better product, a better quality product, we can get that figure down to 40 gigajoules per tonne. We've done, that's all theoretical. We then did some analysis last summer, or last spring, uh, and, and we found these figures uh, from a low-pressure sand casting foundry in Canada, which I'm sure Steve will be able to name because I've told him where it is. Um, uh, and guess what? The real figures come out at 155 gigajoules per tonne. I was so, so flabbergasted that that actually worked out. We did it for a low-pressure die-casting foundry in, in Italy. 
they come out to 115 gigajoules per tonne. This is showing the flow of metal, the flow of materials. This is sand and dye and, and recycling material, and the flow of energy in the yellow. And uh, we looked at a high pressure die casting foundry, 98 gigajoules per tonne. It's, it's amazing that these figures actually work out. So these are real figures from real, real foundries coming out in this way. We looked at a cast iron sand foundry. This is interesting, Steve, because everybody's going for light weighting. 34 gigajoules per tonne. This is, this is interesting. So what happens now if we start looking at the actual overall manufacturing process rather than just looking at tailpipe emissions from cars and we actually add in the manufacturing costs of the car? Um, I'm not making any more comments on that. Um, so just a, the interesting story is the picture. Let me tell me the, sto the story of the picture. So this is the picture of the, of the factory at the beginning. And this is Volvo Schurfer Foundry in Sweden, the truck foundry. And they had a collaboration with some academics at Jönköping University in Swedcast. They tried to apply the latest research and ideas. They believed in possibilities. They said the status quo is not setting stone, will change things. And, and innovation, not cost accounting, which came out absolutely in that first lecture today. Let engineers innovate and don't be hidebound by the costs. That's really, really, really important. And that's what they did. And they developed this new process, the FPC process, which is a chilled mold. So they, they moved away, they sand casting, cast iron, used as little sand as possible, put steel around the outside, and then cooled it with water. So they could capture all that, solidif that solidifying energy in the water and use a heat exchanger to take the energy out. Uh, they get a yield of 75% because they use a novel running system which was, went against the normal principles. So the sort of thing that I try to develop into casting practice. And what did they end up with? They ended up with 50% lower energy because they recycle most of the, the, the cooling water. They end up with, this, the ventilation is, is amazing, so they get no, no pollution out to the atmosphere. 90% of their sand is recycled, so it's all recycled in-house. You can't do 100%, unfortunately, because the sand actually degrades. Uh, they have everything inside, nothing on the roof, so they don't lose anything to the outside world. So all the motors and everything are inside. They don't put stuff on the roof. Everything's inside the factory completely. And their total energy consumption is 590 kilowatt hours per tonne for the foundry. Now, the, the theoretical is about 500, so they're only about 40, uh, 560, sorry, 550. So they're 40 kilowatt hours above the theoretical. That's really, really, really good. And uh, the other advantages, no heating equipment for the building needed, thanks to heat recycling, no bentonite or coal dust, and it's absolutely clean. There's no basement, and that's what it looks like. It's, it doesn't look like a foundry. It doesn't look like what you imagine a foundry to look like. It's absolutely clean. This is a cast iron foundry, for God's sake. I walk around that with a white shirt on, and I come back out clean. You don't even have to wear safety stuff, because it's all there. And the interesting story is that's what it looks like. What they said to me is that they'd like to get Adobe paint, uh, paint book and paint out the chimney, because the chimney's not used. It's 100 meters high. It costs 10 million Swedish crowns to put in. That's a million euro, approximately a million euros. And it was forced on them by the planners, by the local planning community. They said, you need to have a f chimney, a really big chimney, because you're putting a foundry there. They said, we don't. There won't be any emissions. So there are no emissions from this foundry at all. All the heat from here, if there is any excess heat, goes into water and into the district heating in Shervda, the town. So they don't have any emissions, and if there's any excess heat, which is not required for heating the offices or the keeping the right temperature, it goes to Shervda. But you have to start doing this from scratch and start thinking beyond what is normally done. So disruptive innovation is what we have to go for to make these really big changes. I've said we can do it with aluminium from 90, to fit for 90 gigajoules to from 1,500 gigajoules down to 40 gigajoules per tonne with an innovative pro process. Potentially, if we did low-grade heat recovery, we could recover another 320 terajoules per annum in the UK. 
And that's potential saving like that. But we have to look at it holistically. We have to look at embodied and process energy. And we have to look at the carbon footprint as well. I haven't looked at the carbon footprints, but it would be very interesting to do that. Uh, and I think that's it. Thank you very much.